Just sit right back and you'll hear a tale of the NHL's bullshit And a hockey player who set sail on a fake-ass ally ship Attend the tale of a frozen pond and surprise tape on a stick And a Halloween costume he wore on a fake-ass ally ship On a fake-ass ally ship Weather started getting weird and the tiny ship was tossed. The player said, buddy, I'm just here to get my photo op. To get his photo op. The ship set ground on a desert shore. He knew it was a one-way trip. He shrugged and said, I've been here before on a Vegas ally ship. Puck face, you watch too much hockey. Puck face from Monday. Live from Taylor's apartment, it's Puckface Podcast, where hockey culture and counterculture collide. I'm Alaris, the producer and occasional interrupter. And now, the man who puts the rant in Miko Rantanen, here's Taylor. You remember about a half decade ago when NHL players were first asked, how would you respond to a teammate coming out as gay? And the response you heard from every player was, oh, it wouldn't change a thing, they'd be the same guy to me as they were before. So why in 2017 do we see consistently bad allyship from NHL players? I've always felt that the problem with it wouldn't change a thing is that it envisions a kind of allyship where I don't have to change anything about myself. If someone I care about comes out, it ought to change my assumptions about the world around me and about what people's needs are. When I come out to a friend as having invisible disabilities, I expect them to make an effort to learn which side I can hear and see out of. I expect people to respect that I get migraines and have to back out of things, or I get overwhelmed and anxious and I might not have an immediately articulate response to something. When somebody comes out to me as queer, I ask them what I can do to support them specifically as a queer person. F the golden rule. Don't treat people how you want to be treated. Treat them how they want to be treated. Hi, this is uh, our second attempt um, at recording episode four of Puckface Podcast. We uh, just finished recording um, uh, the 40-minute episode uh, about oh, 20 minutes ago, and I went to save it, and I got the little the little Mac colory spinny thing that just stayed there, and I looked at it longingly for about five minutes, and then I forced quit, and there was nothing left when uh, I opened GarageBand again. So this is our second time recording this entire podcast i had gone out for a cigarette and i came back in and taylor said so there's some bad news we lost everything and there was this big pause where i was like creating this other world in which this was just a funny joke (laughs) (laughs) and i waited for taylor to step into that world with me but alas no no we live in a world where we're doing this again (laughs) <laughs> um, but you're hearing it for the first time, and that's all that matters. Uh, so yeah, today we're um good, well today it's freaking nighttime now. But um, wh- whenever you're listening to this, we're gonna talk about fake ass allies, the NHL season thus far, and other fun things. But first, the news. A Winnipeg mom says her son was given Xanax tablets while trick or treating. The mom says she became suspicious when people dressed as hippies jumped out of a bush and started pill-shaming him. (laughs) Heyo! Alberta has scrapped a bill that would have ended daylight savings time. This would have put the province two hours ahead of BC for part of the year, though it had still remained two decades behind on culture and social issues. A new study shows a miracle described in the Bible was actually a solar eclipse. Experts in the field of optometry are using this as a reminder to encourage people never to stare directly into a Bible. A new study claims that divorce can be genetic. Researchers say this is the most sobering discovery in the field of genetics since you left me, Susan. Oh. And finally, a stolen 1930s Stanley Cup ring has been recovered in Nanaimo, B.C. Police expect the ring to be returned to Yarmou Yager any day now. Oh. And that's the news. 
A whole month of hockey has been played since our last episode. I've been busy with another project, but I'm here now, so here are five thoughts from the first month of the 2017-18 season. Yes, for the first time on the podcast, I'm going to talk about actual hockey games. Feel free to fast forward nine and a half minutes if you're here for the usual political takes. First of all, I just have to pump my own tires for a second. On day one of the NHL season, Alaris and I were watching a great TV show called the Pittsburgh Penguins vs. the St. Louis Blues. Solid pilot. Yes, <laughs> and during the game, I made this note. Crosby adapting to the new face-off rule by taking draws a half step further back than everyone else so he can rotate further forward as the puck is dropping. That was on October the 4th, and here's an NHL coach quoted in Elliot Friedman's 31 Thoughts column dated November 1st. Quote, the next time you watch Pittsburgh, see how Crosby concedes the circle. He's just letting them have the dot. By doing that, other players are leaning in, going off balance, and losing. I wish we had done this episode before that column came out, because it really makes me look like I know what I'm talking about. You nailed that. I sure did. Which brings me to number two, I was dead wrong about several teams. In particular, Arizona, St. Louis, and Edmonton. You fucked that up. I sure did. I thought the Arizona Coyotes would be better. I was thinking, okay, 84 to 88 point range, but I did not see zero wins in their first 10 games. Zero out of 10, heckin' bad dogs. I've watched nine St. Louis games. Holy shit. I thought Fabry being out would hurt them more. I thought Bomeister being out would hurt them more. Jake Allen had one bad game against Florida. Other than that, whatever goalie coach and sister-in-law cheater with Marty Brodeur is doing really works. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> And it's not even allegedly, because he admitted to it. I noticed uh, a nice coaching adjustment Mike Yo made against Calgary in a game that we watched. Uh, the Flames were gapping up really tight to the Blues forwards on zone entries, so what Yo did is he had his guys just dump the puck in and chase it, the way he did back in Ot 4. And uh, the Blues scored very quickly by doing so, because suddenly the Flames' D are caught up high. As for Edmonton, I thought they'd be tops in the Pacific, and they still could be, but I had them in the Cup Final, and I feel silly. I've watched 11 of their games now, and while Chris Russell is deservedly unpopular in the advanced stats community, I don't understand how people even say he's good based on eye test. I count almost a goal against per game where you can say he was directly responsible. Against Vancouver, he does a no-look pass to Brandon Sutter, who scores, because you have to get that guy to score somehow. He loses his man on a Shifley goal against Winnipeg. Against Philly, he doesn't pick up Giroux, who scores. And then he defends a two-on-one like a salmon for the winning goal late in the third. I like salmon. It's salmon. It, I, I have a tin of salmon in the cupboard if you want some. I just feel weird doing that banter a second time. <laughs> I was going to say, uh, okay. Huh? Go back and undo it. Oh, no, it's fine. Uh, I'm continuing. Um, I don't want to risk losing anything. But I just really like salmon. I just <laughs> wanted people to know. Okay. Well, now they do. Uh, Chris Russell had a good game against Dallas. That's it. And Peter Shirelli traded Jordan Eberle so they could pay Chris Russell $4 million, and now they're looking for scoring on the wing. I like wings, too. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that, that one she did not do in the first recording. That's pretty good. Um, I know Shirelli always gets shit for the Hall for Larson trade, and the Eberle for Strom trade, and the Sagan for Erickson and a bag of magic beans trade, but what about trading a 14th overall pick for Griffin Reinhardt, who's supposed to be this stud defenseman, but they end up leaving him exposed to Vegas in the expansion draft, who then puts him on waivers. When they could have just used that pick to take Matt Barzell, who everyone and their dog knew was the best player available, and who, by the way, just had five assists against Colorado, two of them were on Everly goals. You like how I pivoted to stuff I'm right about? Yeah. Number three. Hmm? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> did you have did you have more banter that you wanted to say for a second time today? <laughs> I did not. I was saying yes. I did like how you pivoted to stuff you're right about. Okay. Number you're, three. You weren't going to make the joke about Griffin Reinhardt and stud defensemen and horses? Make the <laughs> joke. Do the joke again. Uh, he said stud defensemen, and I thought maybe that meant it was a really good defenseman who they send other defensemen to to beget, you know, baby good defensemen. Alberta. Horses. Right. Um, number three, I was right about some teams. I was right about New Jersey, the New York Rangers, and the Washington Capitals. The East looks about how I had it looking. My Western Conference is a mess. 
Uh, I didn't have New Jersey in the playoffs, but much like Arizona, I thought they'd be a lot better than people were predicting. They're young, they're fast, they're going to fall off a bit, but they've been fun. Imagine that. The Devils are fun. I watched their game against Calgary last night while coveting my roommate's vegan poutine. It was a 5-4 shootout loss. There were two penalty shots. On that point, Sportsnet, you need to get Cassie Campbell Pascal doing color on more games. She's so sharp, and her talent is wasted doing player interviews and shit. By the way, best play-by-play teams in the league? Future episode. That's going to be a good one. I thought the Rangers would take a step back, and they have. Uh, Henrik Lundqvist is letting in some goals that look really stoppable. He's not sealing posts in time, and shots from weird angles are going in, and he just looks rattled. More so than usual. He always looks rattled, but this year he looks really rattled. Aww. I had Washington as the second wildcard team in the East, and that's about where they are. They really miss Nate Schmidt. They miss him more than any other team misses the guy they lost in the expansion, in the expansion draft. Yes, I'm including Pittsburgh. Christian Jerry's going to be fine. Um, That being said, Lars Eller is playing incredible hockey right now. There were two goals against the Islanders last week that directly resulted from his back-checking. Number four, the Tampa Bay Lightning are going to win the Stanley Cup. Yes, they do not give out the Stanley Cup in November, though they kind of did last year if you're someone like Tim Thomas. But I've watched eight of their games. That's enough for me. They're winning it, which means JT Brown is winning the Cup. Yay! Yay! You know how most human beings have an area between their arms and their torso where most of the time there's space. You can throw something or wiggle something through that area. Yeah, Andre Vasilevsky doesn't have that. There are no holes in his body for pucks to go through. I saw him move laterally on a two-on-one against Florida. He stops a rocket with his armpit. I wonder if that tickles. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, with all the padding they have, probably it doesn't hurt. No, it's stopping a rocket with your armpit. Um, I- Sorry. Go on. I, but enough about uh, uh, defense, defense policy from the 1980s. Um, Nikita Kucherov is out of his mind good. You got your Sergachev. You got your Braden point. Uh, we made a joke in the musical episode about Yanni Gord, who played for Tampa during the injury season of Doom last year. He's actually really good. He's not a finisher. In a game against Anaheim, he had an empty net, and he just needed to wrap the puck around from behind the net, and he just kind of feathers it into a beaten John Gibson's body. But it seems like he wins every puck battle, and he's never out of position. He's swell. So, congratulations to the 2018 Stanley Cup champion. I don't know. Pittsburgh Penguins, probably. And for number five, I was going to talk about Vegas. But I need to give my take on the Matt Duchesne trade for the second time in the last two hours. Um, It is a three-way deal. I, myself, have never had a three-way. Although I have had a four-way. Nashville sent us to Colorado. A second round pick prospect of uh, Vladislav Kamenev and a blue chip D prospect in Samuel Girard. In return, Nashville gets Kyle Turris from Ottawa. So you give up Girard, but you still have Dante Fabro coming up, and your center position is now one of the best in the league for the first time in franchise history. David Poyle is the best trading general manager in the NHL. Colorado sends Matt Deshane to Ottawa. In return, they get the pieces I mentioned from Nashville, as well as Ottawa's first and third round picks in 2018, prospect Shane Bowers and goalie Andrew Hammond. So an elite forward for a first, second, third, three prospects and a backup goaltender. Contrast that to Peter Shirelli trading an elite forward in Taylor Hall for one guy. Now, Shirelli and Sackick were trying to accomplish different things with those trades, but looking at recent returns for elite players, Sackick did the best he could here. Ottawa essentially trades a bunch of futures and Kyle Turris for a guy who is measurably but not significantly better than Kyle Turris. That looks bad. But here's the thing. While Pierre Dorian gave up a lot to get Matt Duchesne, Kyle Turris wasn't staying in Ottawa after this year. His only option was to trade Turris at the deadline for a low first rounder and a prospect and move forward with Derek Broussard as your best centerman. That cannot happen. You only have Eric Carlson in his prime once. He doesn't give up Shabbat, White, or Brown, so I don't hate the deal for Ottawa either. Ottawa cut off both their thumbs in order to not lose their head later. Colorado cut off their head for the chance of growing another head. And Nashville is walking around with a duffel bag full of other general managers' limbs. And that is just as disturbing as it was last time. (laughs) So, let's talk about allyship. Yes, let's. So, before we get to any specifics, just a a few general thoughts on allyship and what it means to be an ally. 
I used to call myself an ally. I wouldn't do that anymore. It's not for me to apply that label to myself. It's better to live my life in such a way that others would call me that. And also, it's a title that can be revoked at any time. It's not a flag I can stick in the ground and point to when someone brings to my attention a pocket of ignorance or action that I've taken that was me being a bad ally. Alaris, any, any thoughts on this? Um, yeah, what I had talked about before um, was how I sort of am immediately suspicious of someone who claims to be an ally. Um, just because I've had some really harmful run-ins in my personal life, and I have seen this happen to other people, uh, where someone, you know, calls themselves an ally, and they've learned enough of the language, and they, you know, can put on a, a good enough show to gain access to safe spaces for marginalized people, or gain access to marginalized people. Um, and just basically enact their gross, uh, oppressive, predatory sometimes behavior. Um, and it's terrible. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. I know that, you know, some people are just, they're really doing their best. They want to be an ally. Um, and they don't quite get that it's not something that, um, that you get to say you are. It's something you have to be doing all of the time. Um, but still, I, when, I, when I see that, um, that flag, <laughs> yeah. when I see someone trying to put down that ally flag, that's a giant red flag for me. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, in, its, in its original Latin form, um, ally comes from a, a word meaning to bind together. It is a verb. It is not uh, a noun. It is literally an action. Yes. Um, yeah. So that brings us to, to, first of all, I wanted to talk about Halloween. Um, you can tell a lot about what a person doesn't find really that threatening by how they choose to dress up for Halloween. T.J. Oshi dressed his kids up as Melania, Melania and um, Donald Trump mm. because I almost said millennial. Um, <laughs> <laughs> They're ruining everything. <laughs> Um, You're ruining Halloween. Oh my god. <laughs> okay, sorry. Um, <coughs> anyway, um, because yeah, tr Trump's uh, oppression of, of Muslims, queer people, disabled and sick people, and uh, people of color is ultimately harmless to T.J. Oshi, as well as all the hockey pundits who've been tripping over their cis white male selves in order to defend him, and Connor McDavid, who dressed up as Trump. This is one of those many cases where mainstream hockey pundits will refer to a nebulous outrage happening Ugh. while giving zero specifics as to the actual criticisms people are making. A costume is never just a costume. It is a commentary. It's always been a commentary. That's kind of the point of Halloween. Sometimes that commentary is, I drew on some cat whiskers. Gosh, I feel cute. Perfectly okay. Very okay. Yeah. More than okay. Yes. That is great. It's fine. Um, but, but when you dress up as Trump, you're reframing the harm he does to people through a lens of comical buffoonery, which in no way hurts him. It in fact helps him by making everything he espouses appear less threatening. How did we not learn this from Jimmy Fallon? I would believe Connor McDavid if he said his costume was supposed to be satirical. I would also say stick to hockey because that's not good satire. Unless you give something like that additional layers of analysis, all you're really doing is flaunting how little he affects you. Yep. I highly doubt that Trump is very funny to JT Brown, who has gotten death threats because of him, or Devante smith Pelly, who plays with TJ Oshie. So, in addition to all of that, uh, a bunch of male players dressed up as women for Halloween. Patrick Laine did it, uh, Colby Armstrong dressed up as Daenerys Targaryen, and everyone laughs because ho ho ho, a man in a dress. Braden Holtby marched in pride this summer, despite the fact that he showed up to the Caps 2016 Halloween party as a bearded woman. That was the whole point of his costume, woman with facial hair. And white cishet hockey Twitter holds him up as this great ally because he showed up at pride. Bar. Are we really going to pretend in 2017, that the inherent joke of a bearded woman doesn't, doesn't rest entirely on transphobia? Are we really going to pretend that's not exactly what's going on? 
I did drag on Halloween years ago, and I wouldn't do it again because I've listened to what trans people are saying every Halloween. You'd think that with hockey is for everyone and you can play initiatives, that NHL players would get some education on this so that their allyship goes beyond lip service and photo ops and using pride tape and practice once a year. So here's what Devante smith Pelly said when black players were being asked about protesting during the anthem and about their experience in pro hockey. Quote, There's a little bit of a lonely feeling. All of us are on teams by ourselves. There's not two of us together or three of us together. So if one of us were to do this, kneel during the anthem, and nobody else on the team jumps in, you're really by yourself. I can go to Joel Ward. He understands what I'm going through as a black man in America. I can't go to anyone on my team and have them understand really how it is to be in my shoes. They really don't understand. So it's really lonely in that sense. You don't really have anyone. End quote. When Smith Pelly says it's really lonely in that sense, I don't buy for a second that his teammates have actually made an effort to understand his experience. No one offered to take a knee with him. So not a real big surprise that Devontae Smith Pelly doesn't feel he can go to TJ Oshie or Braden Holtby when he feels alone as a marginalized person. Because for guys like Holtby, showing up at Pride is all about the appearance of being a nice guy. It's all PR. And anyone who praised Holtby marching in Pride despite his costume choice a year ago needs to look at their own allyship and ask whether it's performative. Mm -hmm. Chris Kunitz was the You Can Play ambassador in Pittsburgh. When JT Brown raised his fist during the anthem, Kunitz did nothing publicly to take any of the burden off of him. If you're going to be a You Can Play ambassador in the NHL, this is the time where you step up. There you go. It shouldn't be the job of the 30 black players in the NHL to carry the burden of supporting black athletes. JT Brown got death threats for even talking about kneeling, and the only reason he raised his fist the one time is because he needed to protect his family, who was also receiving threats. Chris Kunitz and the rest of JD Brown's teammates would not have had to worry about a fraction of the level of backlash had they taken a knee or spoken up and said anything at all substantive. Speaking of fake-ass allies, Andrew Shaw. Andrew Shaw, inexplicably, is the You Can Play ambassador for the Montreal Canadiens, and when it appeared as though he'd used an F-slur in the penalty box for a second time, even if he didn't actually say that word, he could have said something in support of all the queer fans on social media who were being harassed by cishet fans in the aftermath. He could have said something like, look, it's okay that queer fans didn't give me the benefit of the doubt there. Why should they? So stop making hockey Twitter unsafe for them, please. But nope. His only concern was defending himself and protecting the redemption arc image, which he clearly feels entitled to. If you think you're entitled to absolution, guess what? You're not an ally. Mm -hmm. Also, and I don't know why I've seen no one mention this, if Kyle Lowry of the Toronto Raptors can come out against Trump's travel ban on Muslims, surely the Habs You Can Play ambassador could say something about the Quebec government targeting Muslim women who use public transit while wearing face coverings. If, if Kyle Lowry can say what he did while playing in Canada, Andrew Shaw can speak out about something happening in the province he plays in. I know it's not hockey-related, but he chose to be the You Can Play ambassador. It would have been huge for Muslim hockey fans. Yeah, you didn't have to do that, Andrew Shaw. You stepped into that role. Yeah. The more politics and sport collide in 2017, this is something I've been thinking about lately, the more apparent it is to me that pro basketball players are the decent human beings we in Canada insist pro hockey players are. So, um, I'm just going to take over the next bit here, um, and just putting out a content warning for the next three minutes. We're going to talk about Patrick Kane's tweet about Bauer's Women's Hockey Initiative. Patrick Kane has been accused of sexual assault. Also, there will be a brief description of a physical assault. So, if you need to skip ahead here, please do. So, Bauer... The hockey equipment brand partnered with Marie Philip Poulin and Hillary Knight in a campaign to encourage customers to engage with women's hockey. 
They made a 20 second YouTube video of Kulan and Knight working out and being awesome and are promoting it with the hashtag women's movement never stops. Patrick Kane, who has been accused of sexual assault as well as choking a woman in a bar in two separate incidents, the second one with multiple eyewitnesses. He also punched a male cab driver in the face. He posted the Bauer video to his Twitter account saying, proud to support the movement, hashtag women's movement never stops. Besides the disgusting attempt to position himself as an ally, how exactly are you supporting the movement? Did you donate money to this initiative? Have you donated actual money to any women's hockey programs? Or better yet, have you donated money to any relief shelters or crisis lines? If you're listening to this and thinking, well, he's innocent until proven guilty. Fun fact, this podcast is not a court, and I believe the people Patrick Kane has harmed. I believe the people Patrick Kane has harmed. And for that matter, filing a false report is a crime, so why does presuming innocence never seem to apply to victims? All that aside... I don't believe Patrick Kane is so dense that he doesn't realize his tweeting about this is not welcome. If he wants to do anything helpful, he can keep his platitudes, shut his mouth, and open his pocketbook quietly and anonymously. I laughed at the end of the, the video because the first suggested thing to pop up is another Bauer video, which features the white male owner of Bauer, who is profiting from the women's campaign. Hello, Elf. Also, just a comment on Jonathan Taves. Everyone loves to position him as this great ally who is woke about protests and climate change. He still chooses to be BFFs with Patrick Kane. If you choose to shelter somebody like that, you're complicit in their behavior. You're not an ally. The day the NHL introduced its Declaration of Principles, it included Patrick Kane in its preseason media tour. The day they rolled it out, they undermined it. They could have showcased dozens of other players. They chose Kane. Okay, no more Patrick Kane talk. On to xenophobia. Uh, I just wanted to touch on Tyler Sagan's comments and some of the fallout I saw around it on hockey Twitter. So this will be juicy for some of you. <coughs> Sorry. No worries. Uh, so Jashvina Shaw at Ice Hockey Stick on Twitter. Yay, we, we love. love her. Yeah. Um, retweeted a quote from Tyler Sagan talking about people in his dressing room speaking in their native languages that said, quote, sometimes you have to put your foot down. We in, uh, we're in North America. We're not going to have a team of cliques. Bar. Shaw pointed out that, uh, quote, not only is telling people to speak English annoying, but it is also racist. You can't force someone to learn the language and not assigning interpreters, which some teams apparently refuse to do, is cruel. Letting people have their culture and bond over it is not creating a division in your locker room. Your words are creating one, end quote. At this point, two women from Hockey Twitter jump into Shaw's mentions and start dictating to her what is and isn't racist. One of these women, when challenged on it, busted out the old 16th Cherokee defense, and later admitted to facing no racism in her entire adult life. How about that? The other one was Piper of Shut Your Five Hole, which is really disappointing. Shut Your Five Hole is a podcast that positions itself as being an alternative and progressive voice out there in the hockey media void. Piper contended that it was, quote, tone deaf, but not racist, which congratulations on being ableist, in addition to being a white woman lecturing a person of color on racism. What Tyler Sagan said was not congenital amusia, which affects 4% of the population. It was bigotry. It was xenophobia, which is rooted in and doesn't exist without racism. Fellow white people, this is you and me talking here. Don't ever dictate to a person of color what is and isn't racist. That's bad allyship, and it's also casual racism. People of color know what is and isn't racist far the fuck better than we do. So a few people, myself included, told both of them that, hey, dictating to a woman of color what racism is and isn't is pretty shitty. To which Piper responds, to someone else saying the same thing, I think you should be careful assuming other people's ethnic backgrounds. Which, okay, Ancestry.com, but two minutes ago you tweeted this, quote, It in no way excuses what Sagan said, but a white male commenting on other white males from white nations isn't racism, end quote. So... 
funny how Piper, with her Lily White profile pic, is allowed to assume ethnicity there when it just so happens to shield her from criticism. Also, white nations? Like, you know why white nations are called white nations, right? I'm reminded of the whole Islam isn't a race argument. Of course it's not a race, but Islamophobia is rooted in racism. Xenophobia is rooted in racism. What Piper and other white people are missing is that xenophobia as a form of bigotry is every bit as much about proximity to whiteness as it is about geography and culture. Just because Sagan's target has white skin doesn't mean his thinking isn't rooted in a white supremacist logic. Now, if when I say white supremacist, the image in your head is tiki torches and white polo shirts, let go of that for a moment and think more workplaces, locker rooms, social groups. You have to view white supremacy as being everywhere, which it is, in order to grasp this. English, within this context, is a dominant cultural expression of whiteness in North America. There's a reason right-wing politicians like Jason Kenney praise immigrants specifically for having unaccented English. He'll never admit to it, perhaps not even to himself, but unaccented is code for white enough. If you're in close enough proximity to whiteness, you're more accepted within society's in-groups. To think this dynamic doesn't play out in workplaces and social groups everywhere is naive. A white man telling other white men from other white countries you're not in close enough proximity to this in-group's dominant expression of whiteness is inherently racist, it's just framing the out-group in a more roundabout and covert way. Saying that, hey, you have to speak English and tone down that culture of yours, is inherently about enforcing proximity to whiteness. If white supremacy doesn't see a person of color around to oppress, what it will do is lock on to a white target deemed not pure enough within the in-group scope of whiteness. This is how white supremacy functions as an omnicidal construct. This is why Jewish people get targeted. This is why disabled people get targeted. They're not being targeted for their skin color, but they are being targeted for their perceived lack of genetic purity specifically in proximity to whiteness. So while I for sure wouldn't say that Alex Radulov or Martin Hansel are experiencing racism per se in that dressing room, it's not at all wrong or contradictory to say that the foundation of Sagan's thinking is based on a racist ethos. Thank you. Um, so, I agree. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> I was nodding my head again a lot. Well, it gave me a chance to have a drink of my beer, so yeah. I appreciate that. So we've talked about bad allyship. I thought I'd give a few examples of good allyship. Whee! Uh, first, this happened last year. Um, the You Can Play rep for the Boston Bruins is Brad Marchand, who has actually called out someone's homophobia on Twitter publicly and for everyone to see. That was hugely important, and it needs to be done by players more often, particularly the YCP ambassadors. So rarely do we see white cishat players reach a breaking point with bigotry where they step in and say, no, this isn't acceptable. Marchand used the safety of his privilege to step up where a queer person would have faced more backlash than him. Good job. Kevin Bieksa helped start a website that assists youth in British Columbia with accessing mental health resources. Yesterday, Bieksa tweeted a DM that he got from a parent saying that the work he'd done literally saved his daughter's life. Bieksa lost his friend and teammate Rick Rippin, Rick Rippin to depression in uh, 2001. Since then, Bieksa has been giving speeches and creating mindcheck.ca, and he's been setting an example just by being a public figure in a hyper-masculine environment, saying it's okay to be vulnerable and reach out. And I love you, Kevin Bieksa. Yeah. And here's one more that I just love. Uh, the Carolina Hurricanes introduced a new feature in their arena that makes watching games live way more accessible for people with sensory processing disorders. They're making uh, photosensitivity glasses, weighted lap bags, and fidget tools available to check out at no cost. They also constructed a quiet area for people who become overstimulated during a live game. This is a program that was proposed to the Hurricanes by an autistic high school senior, so kudos to the Hurricanes, not just for implementing this, but for doing it while being led by the disability community. Speaking as a person with sensory processing issues, that is outstanding allyship. Uh, before we move on, Alaris, did you have any, any, any closing thoughts with regards to what we've been saying? 
<sighs> Pretty much the same as always. If you really want to uh, be an ally to anybody, you really probably need to spend a lot more time stopping yourself from talking <laughs> when you feel like you need to say something. Just don't. Listen. Just shut up and listen. Yeah. I like it. <laughs> I did it again. <laughs> uh, I am supposed to be introducing a segment here, um, which is a regular segment on Puckface Podcast. It's called What's Not Upsetting Taylor About the Vancouver Canucks. I'm not, I'm not upset, upset now. I got, got no regrets, regrets now. now. I don't care about the Vancouver Canucks. So give, give me those Vancouver Canucks. It's a wonderful day for an exorcism. The Vancouver Canucks have a record of 7 4 and 2. They've been playing actually really well. It's been a while, and I was not prepared for this, but these things always happen when you're least expecting them to. Travis Green has them playing a faster, more entertaining style, the Sedins are playing less and benefiting from it, and Jake Furtanen won't ever be the two guys drafted right after him in Ehlers and Nylander, but he looks kind of like a heavier Yannick Hansen. And I can't watch any of it, because it's blacked out on Game Center. I feel like it would have been helpful to know this a little bit earlier, but whatever, it's fine, it's, it's no one's fault. I want to watch this team, and from everything I've seen this team do, it really seems like they want me to watch them. But I can't, except when they're on Hockey Night in Canada, so like the occasional weekend. So, I'm not upset about the requited affection between myself and the Vancouver Canucks. That can go nowhere. <sighs> Oh, I'm sorry, buddy. You know what makes me feel better about requited affections that go nowhere? Giving up on everything and just playing Dungeons and Dragons instead. What do you say? Yeah, whatever. So this is Hockey D&D League. roll some dice. Four of them. Six times. To determine scores for strength, dexterity, constitution, intelligence, wisdom, and charisma. We combine the three highest dice from each roll to get our numbers, and based on these stats, Taylor will decide which hockey player or personality is best represented by that character. Our first two editions of Hockey D&D gave us Shea Weber of the Montreal Canadiens and Matt Cullen of the Minnesota Wild, who will join them in their quest? Alaris, roll Let's... that dice. Oh, okay. <laughs> you're, you're producing the fuck out of this podcast is what you're doing. <laughs> okay, let's find out who's going to join the, the hockey D&D League team. Um, so our first roll is for strength. And we have... I uh, just have to hit the button on this thingamajig it's an app it is an phone. app we it don't keeps have physical dice asking me if i want to rate the app which makes me feel like if i did i would rate it rather low um anyway uh 15 for strength 15 for strength all right above average strength this is a pretty 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 strong guy and throw a body check okay next roll oh and we have an ad for dexterity <laughs> <laughs> um 17 17 dexterity strong and can really control the puck yeah interesting okay oh my goodness we've just rolled for constitution and we have ourselves a 16 a 16 for constitution this is a player who doesn't get hurt a lot can really dangle uh and is very strong <laughs> what do we have for intelligence alaris uh, <laughs> sorry, the, the word dangle just oh, okay. makes me giggle. It's funny. All right. Okay, <laughs> sorry. We have. That's what I thought you were laughing about. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 
<laughs> you know me so well. Um, intelligence, we have a 14. All right, 14. Slightly above average. Um, yeah, all right. Cool. They got they got some skills. They, really, they do. How, um, how, oh, we're jumping up a little bit for wisdom here. They're working with 18. 18 wisdom. So they, they can do a heck of a lot with not a little, but, you know, there's some, like, synergy happening. And they can also figure out what a heck of a lot with not a little means without <laughs> and, having to think of that. And they it can also dangle. <laughs> <laughs> um, however... There has been beer consumed since, <laughs> since the first episode of we this. We got really upset. Since, <laughs> I mean, um, let's be honest, this one is better. Uh, their charisma, however, our um, hockey player here, uh, is 13. Oh, okay. So so 13. Um, they do everything well, but give a good interview. So uh, we're gonna pause right now and we're gonna we're gonna have a little cabal over over who this is. So or we could just go with this role that I did that I just did and say it's 15. No, let's go with 13. Okay, let's go with 13. All right. We'll We're right... not going to cheat. <laughs> we'll be right back. Hi, we're back. Hello. So um, we've decided that uh, based on these roles, the player in question is, drum roll. Don't, don't actually. Oh, yeah, uh, don't do that. Yeah, don't do fine. that. Um, Austin Matthews. <laughs> Yay. Yeah. Austin... Which I am so excited about. Yeah. I love Austin Matthews. If William Nylander is my special little baby boy, my son, Austin Matthews is my nephew. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So he, he's six foot three over 200 pounds. Uh, he's got some strength to him. We have 15 strength, 17 dexterity. The guy scored 40 goals last year. He can really dangle, which is a word <laughs> that you like. Um, <laughs> Constitution 16. Uh, he's, he's, a, he's shown a lot of durability thus far. Um, he was a question mark for tonight's game against Vegas, which is being played right now. And we were supposed to be watching it, <sighs> but instead we're recording this goddamn thing for the second time. <laughs> so we're assuming he's playing tonight. <coughs> um, uh, yeah, it's, it's intelligence, um, uh, average to above average. He's he's got. It, I mean, we're kind of lowballing it there. The, the intelligence should maybe a little bit be a little higher than fourteen, but whatever. Wisdom eighteen. He is wise beyond his years. He knows how to use the skill set he has, um, and charisma. 13. I mean, anytime he's been um, asked to give answers of, of substance, there's been not a lot. And maybe that's just because he lives in the Toronto media fishbowl and wants to keep things neutral, which I can understand. Um, but yeah, anyway, Austin Matthews, Shea Weber, and Matt Cullen. Congratulations! Congratulations! <laughs> Austin <laughs> who will join them in their quest next time on hockey D and D find out by keeping on listening to the podcast. <laughs> and uh, with that, we come to the end of episode four of puck face podcast. But before we go, here's Alaris with an important commentary, more of a question, really a question that lives at the very core of my being. Why? If the universal translators make it so that the hearer hears everything as though it's being spoken in their native language, why does Klingon still sometimes sound like Klingon? And that's all the time we have for today. Follow us on at PuckFacePod on Twitter. Find our captioned episodes on the PuckFacePod YouTube channel. Download us on iTunes or wherever free podcasts are sold. Or just listen to us on SoundCloud, if that's the shape of your heart. Now get out of here, you puckface. 